So your past does not define you. It doesn't define anything about you. It just informs you. And that's what we're going to be talking about in today's webinar. Because, and I was not able, I really did. I really did look to see who said this. I could not find anything. Everyone says it's unknown. So we're going to go with unknown. But never be defined by your past. It was a lesson, not a life sentence. How cool is that? I like that quote. So you're in the right place if you've tried to write a book, but have never finished it. You're in the right place if you've written a book, but have never published it. You just got a manuscript lying around. And you're in the right place if you've actually published a book, but it's not doing what you want to do. And you're like, ah, the book failed. Any of those things, you are in the right place. So what you will learn today is the truth about fast, fast mistakes. <laughs> yeah, maybe you'll learn about that too. The truth about past mistakes, the role of the subconscious, what you can learn from past failures and mistakes, and how to change your subconscious thoughts. And before I go into all this, just in case you don't know who I am, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about me and why you should listen to me about this topic. I'm the creator of the world's first author diagnostic software. What Part of what I do is dive into people's author career, author business, their books, their book ideas, and I find out where they're strong, where they could use some work, and I help them make thing, their future better. Basically, I help them make sure that their past books don't define their future books. I'm all, I, And how did I come up with this information? Well, I am the author of five books already. And believe me, I've learned from every single one of them. I've contributed to numerous anthologies. Uh, one of my books has won two awards, three awards, and two of my books have been in the bestseller in, the t in at least three categories on Amazon. I am a certified Storyway guide, and I'm certified in author ma marketing, and, and this is probably the most important, and I've failed lots of times, but I keep plugging away. I don't let it stop me, and I don't let those past failures define me. So what is the truth about past mistakes? This is what Rick, and I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce his last name, but Rick Huguenier said, he said, memory are who we are, but making memories is also a, bi a biological process. So it's twofold. And so what I'm going to do now is go a little bit geeky on you and share a little bit about how memories are made, which informs why they aren't a good source of information for where we are now and where we're going to go in the future. So what is memory? The definition is, it is that it's a continued process of information retention over time. It's also an integral part of the human cognition function. And it gives us all a framework through which we make sense of our present and our future. And so how does it work? Well, the first part is it is encoding. And you can encode things visually, acoustically, semantically, or tactilely. So what this means is that you experience something and then you store it in your brain either as a visual. So like you remember the way it looks. You remember acoustically, you remember the way it sounds. Semantically, you understand what it means, you remember what it means, or tactically, you remember how it felt. And that can be both physically and emotionally. But the problem here is that, I mean, one of the, one of the problems here is that whatever you experience out there isn't always stored in the same mode, modality. So for example, you see something, but you store it as a a tactile memory or an acoustic memory. You hear something and you 
remember it, how it, what it means or how it fails. It's like, just because something is visual doesn't mean it's stored in your memory as visual. And this is important to remember. And then there are two ways that memory is stored. It's there's the short-term memory, which is, allows us to process things very quickly because they're, they're very accessible. And then some of some, but not all of that short-term memory gets archived in your long-term memory. And then there's two types of retrieval. There's the short-term memory retrieval. And that usually that is processed in the order that it, it was stored. So step one, step two, step three, you remember it in that order. However, long-term memory isn't remember isn't retrieved that way. It's a tr it's retrieved by association. So you associate apples with oranges. Why not? Why not? You sort there that's why you get memory triggers because this thing that you remember is associated with something else. And it can be something that's related or it cannot be. And at any point of this entire process I just outlined, things can go wrong. And that causes misinformation. It causes misattribution. There is co a commingling of memories, which is like you remember this thing and you remember this thing. They happen on completely different dates and times, but you remember them as if they were happened at the same time. That's like a commingling of memories. And there's how we interpret it, what we remember. So you had this experience. What was your interpretation of that experience? That is part of the memory. It doesn't mean that that's actually the correct interpretation. It's just your interpretation. So you can see how memory is not a good thing to base your future on. And this is where your subconscious comes in. Your subconscious says, Jenny Davidow, who, or Davidow, I'm not sure. How, I've got all these people with names I can't pronounce. She wrote, embracing your subconscious, bringing all parts of you into creative partnership. And she says, your subconscious is a powerful and mysterious force, which can either hold you back or help you move forward. Without your subconscious's cooperation, your best goals go unrealized. But if your subconscious is working in concert with you, you are unbeatable. So what is the goal of your subconscious? There are two aspects here. Its main goal is to maintain the status quo. That's why you keep doing what you've always been doing. Your subconscious is saying, this is how you've always reacted to this kind of situation. Therefore, this is how you're going to always react to this situation. And it likes routines and patterns. So it like perceives routines and patterns and go, okay, this is the way we do things. And it just keeps chugging along. Let's do it the same way. It's trying to keep you in your little box. But the problem is sometimes that doesn't serve you. Sometimes you are doing the same thing you've always done to a new situation. And that same thing you've always done doesn't work in this new situation or it doesn't serve you in this new situation. But that's what your subconscious wants to do. So your subconscious affects three areas of who you are and how you show up in the world. The first is its effect on your beliefs because your subconscious is where your beliefs are formed and where your beliefs reside. So that's where you hear this term unconscious beliefs or subconscious beliefs. It's because you, for, you have an experience, you create a belief and you store it. And it's all happening in your subconscious. It's not up here in your conscious mind. And beliefs are the driving force for your behavior and your choices. They are informed by seeds of information, emotion, and other input. And those seeds get nurtured by repetition and emotion over time. So you, you have an experience, you create a belief, and then you nurture that belief by picking out the things in your environment that support that belief. And the more something happens, and the more emotions that are associated with those things that happen, the more likely it is to be integrated into your belief system. And this is why this, this overlaps with the law of attraction, because when you have a belief, you seek out, and I talked about this in my last webinar last week, you seek out evidence that supports your subconscious belief. And you filter out 
things that do not support it. So this is how it becomes like a self, uh, like a self fulfilling prophecy because you have a belief and you don't want to be wrong. So you, you gather evidence that says, yes, this belief is true, whether or not it is. Now, remember these four things I talked about earlier, earlier, misinformation, misattribution, commingling of memories, interpretation, all of that can happen at, in the subconscious, at, in the creation and storage of these beliefs. Your subconscious affects your behavior because your choices are determined before they reach your conscious mind. They're, they're determined in the recesses of your subconscious. And your subconscious thrives on keeping you squarely in your comfort zone. So if what's required of you is to get out of your, sub, your comfort zone, your subconscious is not going to help you. It's going to say, no, it's too scary. And your subconscious uses all your past experiences and emotions to inform these choices. That's why we have triggers where like something happens and we're like, oh, and we behave the way we always behaved. It's your subconscious trying to keep you squarely in your comfort zone, squarely in the status quo, keeping that routine. So how do you grow? I'm going to get to that in a moment because there's one other thing. Your subconscious has an effect on your emotions. You see, your subconscious is really impressionable and it is reactive. And when you have an emotional experience, that is going to significantly make an impression on your subconscious mind. Your emotions interact with your subconscious mind more strongly than any other data. So it doesn't matter what that experience truly is out there. It's your emotional response to that experience that creates that subconscious storage, that belief. So what can you learn from past failures and mistakes? This is what Jillian Michael says. The past doesn't define you. Your present does. It's okay to create a vision of the future because it affects your behavior in the now, but don't dwell on past mistakes. Learn from them and focus those lessons in the moment. That's where change can really happen. Because your mindset determines how you deal with mistakes. And I went into mindset, growth versus fixed mindset in great detail in last week's webinar, which is available for the replay is available. But I'm going to do a, a quick little recap right now. So a growth mindset embraces challenges, understands that your brain can be changed, can be trained to do new things. You know, you're not an old dog who can't learn new tricks. You can learn new tricks. And actually, so can old dogs. But that's another story. And you understand that sometimes it takes effort to, to develop mastery and that you learn from feedback and the success of other people inspires you. You're like, wow, if she can do that, so can I. Wow, if he can do that, so can I. I can do that too. Conversely, in contrast, a fixed mindset avoids challenges, thinks that learning new things is just too hard and so doesn't bother to train retrain their mind and they kind of expect rewards without much effort like well I built it why aren't they coming they don't like they don't want your feedback because they don't want to learn from feedback and someone with a fixed mind well often takes the success of others as evidence that they are themselves a failure they don't they aren't inspired by it and how this translates to an author growth and fixed mindset is that author, authors with a growth mindset embrace the challenge that their book prevent, presents them and they face it head on. They learn new things so that their next book will be better. And you know that leads into if at first I don't succeed, I try, try again. I mean, if I kept to what happened with my first book, which actually was in some ways successful, but in other ways, not so much. I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't, I would not have an award-winning book. I would not be a bestseller. I would be stuck there. And uh, an author with a growth mindset learns from mentors, learns from reviews, bad reviews included. And the success of other authors inspires them 
to go for their own success. Whereas an author with a fixed mindset, when they see a challenge, they go, oh, screw this. I'm, and they just stop. They don't finish their book. They don't publish their book. They don't try to do better with their next book. They believe that they can never get the hang of things. If they publish it, they believe readers will just show up. You put, slap it up on Amazon and bam, people are showing up like crazy. That's not how it works. <laughs> and a bad review can like make them want to drop everything and drown their sorrows in a pint of Ben and Jerry's. Or that could be me. We'll see. Anyway, whatever your comfort food is. And other authors' success they believe that other authors have success because that's them. They have some magic pixie dust that I don't have. And that's not true. Nobody has magic pixie dust that no other author has. We all have magic pixie dust. It's just different magic pixie dust. So there are five valuable lessons that you can learn from your mistakes. One is you can discover what works and what doesn't. And trust me, going through all the books that I've gone through, I've learned oh, this, I will continue to do this. I'm not going to do that again. And, and then the next book is better. Past mistakes can help you correct poor behavior. Like, ooh, I shouldn't have done that. It can help you clarify your goals because you're like, huh, that didn't work. Maybe I need to rethink what I'm going after here and learn from this. Going through mistakes hands down, teaches you resiliency, or it should, or it can. I'm not going to shit on you. It can. It can teach you resiliency, especially if you learn from your mistakes. And mistakes can help you learn to accept responsibility and have integrity. And that's really important these days. So we've learned all this. And basically, this is preamble, because you needed to understand what was going on in order for you to change it. So now I'm going to give you three ways that you can change your subconscious thoughts. Because the closer you come to knowing that you alone create the world of your experience, the more vital it becomes for you to discover just who is doing the creating. And that is a quote, quote from Eric McHale Leventhal. So the first way to change your subconscious is through repetition. And the two suggestions I put here are affirmations. You repeat affirmations. And of course, affirmations have a very specific structure. They need to be rooted in the center. They need to be positive. So you, uh, an affirmation is, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> no, it's, I do this new thing. And I do it now. And even if you're not doing it now, an affirmation pretends. Just pretend that you're doing it now. And you can also practice new thoughts. So every time you have a negative thought, you brush it off. And that's a, that's reference to Emmett Fox. He talks about how negative thoughts can be like an ember landing on your sweater. And if you just brush it off, thank you for sharing, reframe, then your sweater stays fairly safe. But if you don't do that and you let it fester there, Next thing you know, your sweater's on fire. Not fun. You don't want your sweater to be on fire. So what you, what a thing you can do to, to reprogram your subconscious is to use affirmations and to reframe negative thoughts. Do not ruminate on them. I know that's easier said than done. But if you continuously try these things, eventually it's like one of my mindset mentors used to talk about how it's like your brain is a bucket of water. And if it's a bucket of dirty water and you keep dropping in clean water, eventually you've got a bucket of clean water or mostly clean water. Because, you know, we're human. We're going to have the, ne the odd negative thought no matter what we do. It happens. It's who we are. But we can have a mostly positive mindset. And that can take some work. And I, and I mean, I've done this work. I, I've lived in an apartment where I had sticky notes all over my apartment with affirmations and, and things that affirmed me and what I wanted to do. And I listened to positive music and I did all these things to retrain my subconscious so that I'm a lot more positive now than I used to be. So a second thing you can do is to change your environment, which sometimes is easier said than done. But here are some 
some suggestions to help at least change it a little bit so that it moves you in the right direction. And one is to seek out positive influences in your life. That means hang around positive people, listen to positive music, watch positive TV shows. I mean, one of the best things I did for my mindset is I stopped watching the news because the news was just so negative. It was like, oh, this bad thing's happening. This bad thing's happening. This bad thing's happening. And I'm like, I just spent so much time of my life being upset about what was going on with things I had no control over. I went, you know what? I don't like feeling this way. So I stopped watching the news. That's one, that's one way to change your environment. You change the negative things in your life and, and either don't do them or replace them with positive things. And that's like, just like stay away from negative influences. If, if you have a friend who's a negative Nelly, spend less time with that friend because you don't need to be taking in that, what I call your energy into your life. It's like, no, it's not nobody loves you. Go eat some worms. People do love you. And unless you cook them right, worms don't taste very good. Actually, I've never eaten a worm, so I don't even know if that's true. <laughs> I've heard they taste bitter, or maybe that was ants. I can't remember because I knew someone who actually ate ants and crickets. Uh, not my thing. So, and the third thing suggestion here, surround yourself with things that make you happy and get you energized. And I've, I've suggested what, and one thing is I actually have a playlist on my phone of happy music. And that actually includes, uh, what's his, Beryl's song, Happy. But it's also other like upbeat, happy music. It's all about being happy. And when I was going, going through that mindset training, I would listen to that while I was in the shower every morning. Every morning I took a shower, I played my happy music. And this is a really good way to do it because when you shower, the largest organ in the human body is our skin. And when, you, when you've got that nice, warm water pitter pattering on your body it stimulates that's why you might have some of your best ideas in the shower because you're you're this organ that covers your body and keeps you safe from most of the time from all the infectious stuff in the world gets stimulated and then it can create creativity but then why not add in some happy music and stimulate happy thoughts or put flowers on your desk if that makes you happy or watch cat videos, which is what I often do. They make me happy. And the third thing you can do is use visualization. And there are different ways to do this. You can use visual reflections because some people can actually visualize things in your head. I am not one of those people, but some people can visualize things in their head. And if that's you, you can visualize what you want in your life. Like close your eyes and visualize what you want in your life. You can also use vision boards. And I, I do have training on vision boards. If that's something you're interested in, you can contact me. I'm not selling that. But that creating vision boards, and there's a process to doing that the right, right way so that it really does inspire you and creates this way of, re, of retraining your subconscious to focus on what you want in life rather than what you don't want. So what's next for you? I've just given you this information. You now know what memory is and how it works and how it can work for you and work against you, how it interacts with the subconscious. What's next? Your past is just a story. And once you realize this, it has no power over you. And that's a quote from Chuck Palat. Why are all the awesome quotes from people who have last names I can't pronounce? I don't know. <laughs> maybe I just need to learn them before I get, I, 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 you know, there is something on Google where you can Google how to pronounce this. And they'll actually have like a recording of it's pronounced this. Although I have to admit, it sounds really weird because I did it for my name. And it's like karma Spence, <laughs> which is not, that's not how I say it, but okay, whatever. Anyway, your past is just a story. Don't let it, don't let it rule how you, how you perceive and behave in your present and moving into the future. Your past is not your destiny. It is your past. It is what has happened 
and you can learn from it to create a new destiny. And thank God, because this is my first book, Bonkers for Bunk Cakes. I mean, look at it. It's less than perfect. <laughs> that is a photograph I took on one of my dinner plates. Actually, it was a dessert plate with a piece of cake on it. And the flower is a flower I have left. It's one of those silk flowers that's a memory of my grandmother. And that was one of my favorite tablecloths in the background. I used this silly font. I included the fact that it was volume this, that, and the other thing, because it, this first book of mine was actually a beefing up of these cookbooklets I used to make every year and give as Christmas gifts to my family. And it's eight and a half by 11. And, but it was, I got it out there and I learned so much from it. And you know what? Even though it's not perfect, it still sells. And this came out in the early 2000s. So it, this has been selling for probably about, what, 15 years, something like that. And this is my latest book, the most recently published book. And it's not perfect either, but it's way better than that first book. I learned with every book I published, I learned something to make the next book better. That's why you're your past is not your destiny because if it was i'd still be creating books like bonkers for bun cakes and i don't think that would fly these days another thing you need to know is that you are not your mistakes you are you your mistakes are things that you may have done and 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 they happened but they aren't you a mistake is simply an action or decision that didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. Oops, move on. And your past does not determine your future. Again, hallelujah. Thank God that that does not happen because I would be, in, we'd all be in, I mean, can you imagine if your past determined your future? That would mean we never got out of diapers. He gads. That would not be a way to live. Just because something bad happened in your past does not mean that it will happen again in your future. And I'm living proof because my first marriage was to a guy who abused me. And my current marriage is to my best friend. And we're about to celebrate six wonderful years together. And I can't believe it's been six years because I feel like I, it, it still feels like I'm a newlywed because I am still so much in love with him. But see, see what I just did here is like something bad happened in my past. I married a jerk, but it didn't define me. I didn't marry a jerk again. I learned, I learned. I mean, it took another abusive boyfriend in between to learn, really learn that, but I learned. Hey, better late than never, right? That's going to be you. You can learn from your mistakes. And forgiving yourself is the first step to moving on. And I know, I know, I know how hard it can be to forgive yourself. Because trust me, I still have my moments where I'm like, marrying that first dude was a boneheaded mistake. But I have to forgive because I was doing the best I could in that moment with who I was then. I'm not that person anymore. I'm a new person because I learned and I grew. And so can you forgive yourself for your past mistakes or they will haunt you and drag you down. So I ask you again, what's next for you? And I'm right now, I'm really speaking to you as an author. You could choose door number one. You could beat yourself up that, about you never finishing the book at, that you started. You could leave that unpublished manuscript in the recesses of your closet and never publish it. Or you could look at the book that you did publish and it failed and go, huh, I'm never going to publish again because I'm a failure. That's door number one. Personally, I hope you don't choose door number one because door number one sucks. It is not a pleasant, happy place to be. Don't choose door number one. Door number two is you could take the information I've just shared with you in this webinar, as well as the one I did last week. I mean, they're free. You've got the information. It's good, solid information. You can take it and you can run with it and do this on your own. And you could make a go of it. You could. 
I, I mean, you are resourceful, right? I, I, I believe in you. You could do that. Or you could choose door number three and seek the help you need to take your book to the finish line. And that may or may not be me. But the thing is, it all begins with the strength of your book idea. And I have something that can help you make sure that that book idea is really strong. And I call it the book idea diagnostic. What a book idea diagnostic session does is it identifies where your idea is currently strong. It illuminates where your book idea needs some work. And it also helps you discern if this is the right book idea for you and your business. And it does this without you needing to guess, without you sitting there wondering if it's right or not. And you don't have to do it alone because I'm there with you. And I can do this with you in as little as 45 minutes. Sometimes it goes longer, but that I have had several sessions that lasted only 45 minutes. And the person left with a really strong idea of where to take their book idea. They knew where it was strong. They knew what they needed to do to make it stronger. And that's even if you've never written a book before, because I've had, I've taken people through this who have never written a book before. It, it works if you're not even 100% sure of the idea. You've got this idea, but you're like, well, I don't know if it'll work or not. I don't know if it's right for me or not. I can help you determ determine that. And it works if you've got like, I've got this series of ideas and I'm not sure which one I should go with first. And all you have to do is schedule your session today. Now, the value of this book idea diagnostic is $997, basically $1,000. But for a limited time, I'm, I'm going to be accepting people to, to book their session for nothing free, gratis, no dineros, no cost. You get 45, 60 minutes of my time, my brain on your book for nothing. And all you have to do to get that amazing session, even if I do so say, say so myself, is go to authoring.com forward slash book diagnostic. But don't take my word for it. Here are three people who have actually already gone through this session. Meet Yasmin Anal. She has not written a book yet, and she's been thinking about this book. And she, you know, she wasn't sure if it was the right book or not. And so when she went through it, this is what she said. She said that she had a, now has a better idea of what to write about, how it's going to benefit her readers, and whether it was something that needed to be in the marketplace to begin with. And she knows how to make it unique and not just write a generic book that's been written to already. Brooke Packard came to me with like a whole bunch of ideas and just really wasn't sure which one she should go with. So she was still confused. She was doubtful. She had no idea where to go with this range of ideas. But after going through the book diagnostic, she found that she found clarity. And she said that I'm able to identify where my weaknesses are and where my strengths are. And also she had a clear roadmap on how to strengthen those weaker parts. She felt much more clarity. She felt hope and she felt raring to go on her next steps. And finally meet Sheila Hawkins. Now Sheila Hawkins is actually a seasoned author. She's written several books. But she found that this whole process gave her not just a bird's eye view, but a really detailed view of where she was so far as her strengths, as well as areas that she needed to work on and to make her next book better. And she understood how addressing those particular things where she needed to work was actually going to help her create a manuscript that she really wanted to be able to publish. And the thing is, you don't know what your blind spots are until you go through this diagnostic and I ask you pointed questions. That's why I invite you to schedule your session today. Again, it's free. What have you got to lose? Just go to authoring.com forward slash book diagnostic. So I hope 
that you found value in this presentation and that you're able to stop making those memories of your past dictate your present and your future. I hope that you're able to take some of the tips I gave giving you today and make your future better as a person and as an author. Thank you for watching.